Okay, Carl, are you ready? Uh, guess can we go ahead. Okay, so are we live on YouTube or? <laughs> yes, you are live on YouTube. You may start. Okay. Good afternoon, one and all. Thanks for joining us on our first African Perspective on Global Climate Change seminars. And uh, we have an excited lineup with you for you. And uh, so I'll be your chair, Dr. Kabir Pirbai from, uh, uh, we have quite a few viewers online and a few uh, here presently with us. And uh, yeah, so I would like to invite first uh, Dr. Carl Palmer to give us a small uh, overview and some of his uh, suggestions on this topic. And uh, yeah, very quickly, Carl, before we kick off with our uh, presenters uh, who are eagerly waiting to deliver their uh, presentations. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as Kabir introduced me, my name is Carl Palmer. I am the Access Education and Training Manager. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the first of this, the African Perspective on Climate Change Seminars. I'm very excited to introduce everybody to this very innovative new uh, seminar series. It's innovative for two reasons. Firstly, in this format, the seminar is not being held anywhere specifically, but also everywhere at the same time. I'd like to welcome, we have groups around the country. I know that we have in two in KZN, three in KZN. We've got Durban, Maritzburg, and Mpangani. We've got one in Venda, we've got one in Vitz. We're, I'm sat here with a group in Cape Town. I'd like to request that all of these locations should be a center for discussions so that we can actually talk about the ideas raised and keep the conversations that are generated going. Uh, I'd also encourage each group to ask questions. That can be done by the uh, through the chairman in each room. We also have people watching live online, so welcome to everybody who's watching from the comforts of your own computer. Uh, welcome to all of you. You're also obviously very welcome to ask questions. You can use uh, the little instant message down the side of the YouTube window uh, in order to type your questions in. Uh, it's also innovative in terms of content. This is a multidisciplinary seminar which looks to draw different disciplines together around the idea of climate change, South Africa and the seasons, and looks to ask what each discipline draws from each other and what each discipline can give towards uh, the other disciplines in solving problems around earth system science. I don't want to talk for too long, but as I say, the whole point of this really is key around starting discussions nationwide with different scientists from different disciplines. So I really, really hope that that comes through and that happens. You can also, after the workshop, still comment on the abstracts, uh, which is also linked to from the YouTube page, and so we can keep the conversations going there. Uh, suffice to say, I look forward to some interesting talks, some interesting discussions, and welcome everyone uh, to the seminar. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paul. So, we have what was all uh, hanging out with us from the P. Um, and I don't know what time it is there, but thank you for joining us, Dr. George, Professor George. And uh, Prof. George Flander doesn't need any introduction. Uh, we all know that he's kind of the person or the reason why we all part of the access group uh, He's the one who was the one who actually initiated the, the project and uh, his expertise um, Speak for itself uh, So he's going to speak about a little bit about how can scientists contribute to alleviating poverty And I think that's a really interesting talk here in South Africa because it's one of our highest South African priorities to alleviate poverty and through his work, he can talk about things like 
uh, the discussion on the nature of science. So I don't want to speak about too much of its practical benefits, and I'll let uh, Prof. Lander do that for us and uh, see how he can contextualize his view uh, from an international view to a local African perspective on global climate change. Uh, over to you, Prof. Lander, and uh, you have 20 minutes, and I'll step in uh, closer to the end of your talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I, I realize I did say in the abstract that I would talk about alleviation of poverty, but I actually have a much bigger request for you this morning. I'm speaking to you from a land in which uh, alternate facts have suddenly become uh, a major issue. And it seems to me that science itself is in danger, is in serious trouble here. And it's in serious trouble in most wealthy countries. Uh, we now have, and not just in the US, but uh, in England with the departure from Brexit, uh, potentially in France, Germany, uh, we have uh, people who seem to believe in what I would call alternate facts. Uh, in particular, we as scientists are regarded as presenting just another point of view, another discourse, uh, whereas we scientists ourselves believe that we're engaged in the search for objective truths. Uh, so we're in serious trouble if, if our very activity is being questioned. And uh, from my perspective, a country that can help the entire globe with this matter uh, is South Africa. Uh, what we have at the moment is extremely polarized state of affairs. Uh, and I'll just confine myself to the polarization as regards uh, global warming. Many of us think that the habitability of the planet is being endangered by various government or failure of governments to act. And the, if we are regarded as simply presenting another point of view, uh, the consequence is paralysis, that nothing is happening. And it seems to me, when dealing with a very polarized state of affairs, the country to turn to for assistance, for advice, is South Africa. Uh, South Africa, in the early 1990s, came to the attention of, of the whole world uh, for the way in which it dealt with a highly polarized state of affairs. Uh, but it was coming to an end. Uh, Mandela became a president, but people started immigrating. Uh, I'm under impression some like a million uh, highly educated young people left South Africa during that time. Everybody was expecting a civil war. And uh, Mandela succeeded in impressing the entire world by the way in which he succeeded in preventing this. So given that we have this very polarized state of affairs, uh, what can we learn from Mandela's activities? And uh, one striking example with which all of you are familiar was the 1994 Rugby World Cup. Uh, and what Mandela did on that occasion is use sports for political purposes. This is very common in, in many countries. Politicians use sports for their own devices. What was unusual about the South African situation was that uh, rugby was basically a symbol of division. It was a symbol of oppression. It's uh, at the time it was a game played by white youths. And uh, how on earth could Mandela succeed in transforming a rugby from a symbol of oppression into a symbol of unity. And there's a movie, I, I didn't tell you the story, there's a movie made about it called Invictus. But uh, one thing Mandela immediately realized, he needed the, the country to support the rugby team. He thought that if South Africa could win that uh, World Cup in rugby at the time, it would unite the country. Uh, however, uh, black South Africans were heavily opposed to this idea. They would not support rugby. How did Mandela persuade them to change their minds? And he did it uh, by realizing that you cannot uh, love that which you do not know. Uh, and, and if you know nothing about the rugby, there's really no reason for you to like it. It, it seems an extremely boring game. And what Mandela did was to get everybody acquainted. You'd have to know the rules of the game, you'd have to know the strategies, you know, I have to, are the stars. 
and if possible, you should try to play the game. And so he sent some of the white players into the townships to help propagate the game. We all know how it ended. Ended with the team winning, and for a period, uh, South Africa was a transformed country. Something similar happened in 2010 with the World Cup in soccer. But my point is that Mandela succeeded by democratizing rugby. Uh, unless you can get everybody engaged and involved, uh, you, the polarization will continue. And I want to submit that we need to do the same with science, that uh, science at the moment is perceived as activity for the elite, for nerds, for very special groups of people. How do we get common laymen to take an interest in science? And uh, uh, we don't have time this morning, but if we did, maybe I can ask Carl to do it uh, at the end of this uh, seminar uh, at one o'clock. Uh, have you look at a video called Harvard uh, Private Universe, uh, and you should only watch the first three, four minutes of this video. Uh, it's a video in which uh, students at Harvard University ask, are asked a very simple question. Why is summer warmer in winter? And uh, they, a voice in the background tells you that of 23 uh, students asked this question, uh, 20 gave the wrong answer. And this caused consternation at Harvard. But the, the strange thing is that from my perspective, this video, which serves to bring to our attention that science education is in trouble, itself contributes to that problem. It exacerbates the problem. And it does so because it conveys the false impression, uh, even the question conveys that impression, that science is a list of facts that you have to memorize. And if I ask you why summer is warmer than winter, and most of the students say it's because the earth is closer to the sun in summer than winter, then I dismiss you as having given the wrong answer and tell you what the right answer is, and uh, you have to remember that, and on it goes. Uh, at, uh, the reason I recommend you watch the movie up to the third minute is at that stage, a young girl, a student, uh, is told that her answer was wrong. And she, response in a very interesting manner. She says that uh, she really has had no science education whatsoever, and it has not handicapped her in the least. That uh, she has a job at Wall Street, she's doing extremely well, thank you, and she is doing this without knowing any science. And I would submit this young woman actually has a point. Here I'm using a product of uh, science, I'm using this uh, I'm not sure what you want to call this. I'm speaking, I can even see you. You're in the other hemisphere, thousands of miles away, many hours and time away. I take this completely for granted. If something goes wrong now, I not the foggiest idea to fix this. We use the products of science, we use cell phones, we fly in airplanes without knowing science. So what is the reason? Why should we? Why do we insist that people ought to learn science? What answer do we give this young woman? And I will argue that the reason for science, and I'll, I'll just try to persuade you of three things why I think everybody should learn science. Uh, the first is, I will argue that science is poetry, in the sense that it's a search for unity in diversity. The second thing I'll speak about briefly is I'll uh, say that science is organized skepticism, and it's the continual testing of hypotheses and beliefs. And then the third thing to keep in mind is that because of this peculiar practice of science, uh, the constant questioning, constant testing of any ideas, science actually has serious limitations. Uh, to lead our lives, we have to have certain beliefs in which we very firmly uh, are committed to. And uh, the problem with science, it is mute on ethical issues. Uh, I can paraphrase Galileo, who in his debate with the Pope, argued that science can tell us how the heavens go, it can tell us how the stars move, how the planets move, but science cannot tell you how to go to heaven. Science does not tell you how to live your life. So let me briefly say something about those three things. If we can impress those three things on laymen, we can, I believe, persuade them that this is an objective activity in which we're engaged. Um, it's a furthermore activity that enriches your life. So let me start briefly 
with why I think science is poetry. And the what I mean by poetry, if I pick up here my cup of tea, I can show you that tea has, that this cup has an ear. And why on earth do I use the word ear to discuss this feature in the cup? Uh, ear is also what I have in my head here. And so I'm looking for unity. I, I could uh, simply saying that certain body parts with which everybody is familiar, which everybody has. Um, this cup has the similar feature. I can argue that the table I'm sitting at has legs. Uh, obviously, humans, humans, animals have legs and they use it to walk and so on. But it, it's another example of how we look for unity in very diverse phenomena. So in the case of science, uh, the students are asked why summer warmer than winter. And so their attention is really the seasonal cycle. The seasonal cycle is enormously diverse. Uh, in Cape Town it rains in winter, in Johannesburg it rains in summer, in Nisner it rains throughout the year. If you go up the west coast of South Africa, it practically never rains. Enormous diversity in seasonal cycles. Everybody experiences a different one. And yet we can come up with a fairly simple explanation. Uh, it will turn out there are really two reasons for the seasons. Uh, the one is that the Earth's axis tilts, and the other one is that the Earth's axis is, the Earth's orbit is eccentric. So if we go back to the Harvard students, we can tell them that given this diversity of seasonal cycles, we can find unity of it by coming up with an hypothesis, a simple one that unites all these diverse phenomena. Uh, they propose that the Earth is closer to the sun in summer than winter. So rather than dismiss them as being stupid and idiotic, let's take this seriously. And so I will ask one of the students at Harvard uh, to call uh, Carl in Cape Town and inquire of Carl, uh, what is the seasons like in your place? You'll quickly discover that uh, this hypothesis uh, must be, if not wrong, it cannot be the end of the story. It turns out the hypothesis that this goes to the sun summer is, is not wrong. Uh, it's simply that uh, it's inadequate. It's only part of the reason. Uh, we can, by simply using email, making inquiries, we can discover that half the planet has summer when the other half has winter. We can also discover through the web that the Earth's orbit is indeed an ellipse. Copernicus knew that. And we are closest to the sun on the 3rd of January. So in South Africa, that answer may actually be correct, that uh, January should be a summer month. That is the case where you are. It's not the case where I am. My point is we're actually making progress. We can go to the next one. We don't have time to go into it. Somebody will say, oh, this axis is tilted. How do we test this? Uh, all you have to do is take a picture of your shadow at noon every day for a few days. From now until July, you'll find that your shadow will be getting shorter and shorter. Me sitting in the northern hemisphere will find that my shadow is getting longer and longer though maybe it's the other way around. Uh, at any rate, from such simple observations, it's possible to establish that the Earth's axis does tilt and that we have uh, occasions called solstices and so forth. But my point is by a, a very logical procedure, uh, we can establish certain facts, we can develop a calendar, uh, absolutely wonderful uh, scientific product. Uh, through the organized skepticism, this valuable tool is produced. The calendar, what's intriguing about the calendar is the naming of the months. Uh, December, Dese, literally means 10, and so December ought to be the 10th month. Uh, November, Novo is 8, ought to be the 8th month. Uh, what, I'm sorry, that's October is 8. Uh, what has gone wrong? But it simply is a reminder of how science by trial and error gradually converges onto more and more accurate truths. So I feel that we sort of can establish the science as poetry, the science as organized skepticism, and then finally, uh, what is the serious limitation uh, that we have uh, that science cannot cope with? And it, it's simply that science can tell you when winter starts, or when summer starts, when you should plant, when you should harvest. Science cannot tell you what you should plant. Right? Science can tell us that uh, global warming increase in CO2 is a problem. 
but science cannot tell us uh, how we should deal with that particular problem because all sorts of subjective factors come into play. I would argue in rich countries, uh, such as the US, uh, global warming ought to be a high priority. In poor countries, it becomes a far more difficult issue. Uh, poor countries, the highest priority is alleviation of poverty. And uh, what should the response to global warming be? And I would submit the response to global warming should be to use it as an educational tool, that it should be a tool to alleviate poverty. Uh, the key to alleviation of poverty is education. And if we can use a phenomena such as the seasonal cycle for that purpose, uh, that will be absolutely wonderful. This has actually started to happen in South Africa uh, with the benefit of large of planet years. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, anyway, with the benefit of large number of planet years, we've developed the Hubble Planet Workshops. I'm still astonished by the response of the students. Uh, if you listen to them speak, they seem completely sincere when they tell you that this has transformed our lives. I'm hoping Rob Donahue will tell us a bit more about this uh, shortly, how this was achieved. But my proposal, and uh, I've sent Carl a, a short summary, uh, typed it out in two pages. Uh, he can distribute it to all of you. What I would like to see South Africa do is take the lead on a new perspective on global warming. Uh, a new perspective on planet Earth. Uh, global warming is such a polarizing topic, it would be best to put, uh, propose a project that turns to something we all experience, namely the seasonal cycle. Uh, it happens whether we like it or not, it's a very really apolitical phenomena. Uh, it's a marvelous tool for teaching science. Uh, it's also a marvelous tool for bridging divides. As I said, different people experience different seasonal cycles. Uh, the, their response to that huge climate change uh, depends a lot on their customs, on their history, their beliefs, their backgrounds. So it's a lesson in how to be compromising when we give advice on how to deal with the seasonal cycle. Uh, I think I've sort of conveyed the essence of my message which is that the world at large, and especially the rich countries, are in serious trouble at the moment. Uh, the, we've succeeded in making global warming such a polarizing topic that it's not possible to have uh, objective discussions of this. If, if we could shift the topic to something such as the seasonal cycle. I, uh, uh, I get the impression the chairman is trying to tell me something. Uh, yeah. He said you have five minutes, George. Oh, okay. Well, why don't I start? I have some pictures, but Carl can show it to you afterwards. Uh, the, the main point of those pictures, or maybe you want to flash to them, is that we are on the most remarkable planet. And I think that stories of gloom and doom are not the best way to attract the, the public. This is just, that's a picture of the Milky Way. What you see there are not merely a huge number of stars, it's actually a huge number of galaxies. And each of those galaxies is an incredible number of stars, galaxies, planets out there. And to our astonishment, there's precisely one that is habitable. The next slide, and what the next slide shows you, the Earth, when you look at it at first, it's the object in the bottom left corner is a very unimpressive planet. Jupiter, Saturn is far more impressive. If we have a closer look at the Earth, the next picture, it, it's, uh, it seems extremely fragile. This is the first picture of the Earth taken from the moon, 1969, and uh, it stirred everybody everywhere. Uh, we, the inhabitants of that very fragile spaceship hanging out there in empty space. Uh, we can go closer at the next picture, and it's, uh, this is a satellite picture of phytoplankton. It suddenly becomes much, much more interesting uh, than it is from a, a great distance. Uh, what you see is a great diversity of uh, uh, climatic zones, both on land and at sea. And if you were to go even closer up the next picture, 
uh, that's just to show Sisyphus temperature patterns on that particular planet. I wanted to bring attention to how much of Southwest Africa and of the east, western coast of South America, how similar they are and how amazingly they change from summer to winter. The next picture is basically illustrates why ours is a habitable planet. Our planet is habitable because it recycles. It recycles water, oxygen, carbon dioxide, all sorts of elements. What you see in this picture, you see snow on the mountain, you see a cloud, you see trees that can be there only if they have water. So there's a hydrological cycle you can infer from that. And it, it's a fascinating cycle. Water can come in various forms. We see all of them there. Uh, the trees are symbols of the most important chemical on the planet, namely photosynthesis, and the beneficiaries are mammals, the elephant, close relative of ours. Uh, the, the next picture shows what's probably the most important chemical action. The message I'm trying to convey is that we live on this absolutely amazing planet, that uh, we should take care of it because it is so amazing. But rather than approach the public with stories of gloom and doom, imminent disasters. We should try to take them, have, take care of the planet because it is astonishing. As in the case of rugby, they have to learn about uh, this particular, uh, why the planet is habitable. Uh, I feel South Africa has succeeded. If we can do this in the context of a project of the seasonal cycle, I see South Africa as the only country that can actually take the lead in such an approach. I'm not saying anything is wrong with the current approach to global warming, but I feel it, it needs a complement, uh, a different approach that appeals to an optimistic side rather than stories of gloom and doom, stories about how amazing we are. I'm going to leave it to, I hope Rob Donahue will tell us a bit more about the seasonal cycle and how it has succeeded in conveying this message. So I leave it at that. Thank you very much. Any quick questions? <laughs> Uh, yes. uh, I'll leave quick questions to the end because I know uh, Prof. Gandhi has a tight schedule. Okay, so Prof. Gandhi is from the University of Stellenbosch. He will be talking about a little bit of the science. Uh, whereby it's a practice that will questions and it threaten the status quo of science. Just by that state, uh, good sets the scene to what his talk's going to be about and what we want to know. And what I want to say about Prof. Guy is that internationally recognized experts in the field of biodiversity and Global change. In city articles published, including such as Nature, Nature, Climate Change. Um, congratulating for getting his NRF uh, rating. He's now an A rated scientist. So I wouldn't do all the talking. I'd now give it to Prof. Guy Mickey, all the way from Stellenbosch. And Prof, thank you for taking the time uh, to be with us. And uh, we look forward to your talk. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for the opportunity, and I, I hope it's all working okay. Um, I'm sitting up in Victoria. Is, is everything working okay? Can somebody give me a thumbs up if you can hear me okay? Yeah, sounds great. Brilliant. Okay. Right, I, I, I really enjoyed. Uh, thanks for, for inviting me. Uh, George, lovely to, to engage with you. Uh, I enjoyed your talk very much. Um, I'd like to, to add a, a perspective to, to George's view. Um, from uh, from South Africa, sort of a certain element of South Africa, I suppose. And uh, I just want to, you know, I'm not going to show any slides. I'm just going to talk, and really just talk from my experience in uh, in the area of converting science into policy, which is its own, you know, has its own set of challenges and its own uh, uh, problems. 
Um, but I, you know, I want to reflect, number one, that we live on this amazing planet, and we don't have an operating manual for it. Uh, you know, whenever you buy a complex piece of equipment, you get an operating manual. So we as a species uh, who are now so, uh, so we, we are now so populous that we've become a force of nature, we don't know how to operate our, our planet. And Earth system science, to me, is one of those sciences, the critical sciences, helping us to, to write that. It'll never be complete, of course, but we have a need of one. We have a serious need of one. And I'm going to tell you the story of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and how it has cobbled together enough evidence to cause a, an historic change in the way that we engage with the planet. So I want to tell you that uh, this year, CO2 emissions carbon dioxide emissions by people have finally leveled off for the last two, two years. Uh, and we're not, in a, you know, we're not in an economic crisis. So for the first time since the uh, 1800s when the uh, Industrial Revolution picked off, we now have a leveling off of fossil fuel emissions. That is an extraordinary achievement and we should celebrate it. It's not to say that it's set in stone that, this, that we, uh, we're turning the corner. But we certainly, you know, having achieved a leveling off according to the Global Carbon Project, what an amazing uh, achievement. Given the fact that there is polarization, but I would submit that the, this polarization of science is, is, is at its most extreme in the United States of America. And we need, you know, they, they, we could ask why. Um, you know, in the supposedly most technically advanced country in the world, we have politicians who would just simply deny obvious science is extraordinary. But that is the case. Um, but luckily enough, there is enough enlightenment in the rest of the world for us to have made this achievement. And most notably in the, the next biggest emitter, China, who have bought into the science, uh, given even you know, that, that it's uncertain, uh, enough to, uh, to have set themselves off on a different path. So despite the polarization, the, what was thought to be impossible 10 years ago has been s achieved, not finally achieved, but provisionally achieved. President Trump is doing his best to turn that around, but uh, we may well have enough momentum to prevent that from happening. And that is an extremely uh, powerful achievement. It's not about gloom and doom. This is an optimistic uh, thing that's happened. So part of the reason that that's happened is that the, the global change story, the global warming story is not necessarily one of gloom and doom. It's also one of opportunity uh, and responsibility. And the science through the work of the intergovernmental panel is now good enough to convince politicians that there's opportunity uh, to be had and uh, we, we have now achieved consensus. This has not been, not been easy. It's taken more than 20 years. The IPCC kicked off in, in the 19, late 1980s. The first report of the IPCC in 1991 said that uh, it would take at least 10 years, at least 10 years to even be able to say that global warming caused by people was unequivocal. And it took indeed another 17 years to come to that conclusion. It was only come to in 2007 in the fourth assessment report where that conclusion, where, where that provisional finding was finally confirmed. It's, it's an amazing story about an arc of scientific assessment, which has been evolving, refining itself. It's the first time in human history that scientists have, have been organized in a multilateral, multi-party way and, and have come up with a, uh, with a system in which they can talk to politicians and co-create, co-craft a policy summary, which is a consensus between a wide variety of parties from as diverse as Saudi Arabia, which is dependent on fossil fuels or used to be, to uh, you know, the smallest state, which is highly vulnerable to being inundated by sea level rise. So, and it's been achieved without invading any other countries. It's been achieved purely through the power of science and the, the power of consensus building. It's taken 25 years, but uh, we have a Paris Agreement and President Trump can wiggle around as much as he likes 
uh, there seems to be enough consensus in the world to continue. So the USA is making itself irrelevant. Uh, and I think that's a good thing. Um, in some ways, it's a terrible thing in other ways, because we owe a huge amount of our knowledge to United States science and United States taxpayers who have funded that science. And it's, we owe a huge debt of gratitude to, to all that work. And it, it's a tragedy that, uh, that this is being, uh, being stomped upon by, by an illiterate, scientifically illiterate uh, administration. Maybe they're not scientifically illiterate. Maybe they know exactly what they're doing. Nonetheless, um, we are still in a very critical stage. Uh, the methane cycle is not stable yet. And uh, we've got uh, ice melt underway, which, which looks very, very, uh, very uh, ominous. Nonetheless, uh, overall, you know, there, there's, there's a, enough optimism to say that a doom and gloom's future is not set in stone. And, uh, but we have to inform, we have to warn people that unless we paint the doom and gloom picture, there's not enough incentive to steer away from it. So that we've got to find the balance between communicating the message and not frightening people. So that, that's a very, very uh, tricky, tricky thing to do. And I just want to say, South Africa has played a key role in these negotiations. I think it's, under, it's an underappreciated story. Because South Africa bridges the two worlds of the developed and the developing, we have played a very significant role in bridging in the negotiations and finding, helping to find consensus. And uh, I think it's an extraordinary uh, achievement for South Africa. We punch above our weight in the, in the IPCC. We have many more scientists involved than even most many developed countries. And I think it's a great thing to aspire to. So, and South Africa is also a great natural experiment in climate change. It's, uh, we, have, we have an amazing country to look at the impacts and, and implications and adaptation responses. So I, I just want to say that, um, you know, science may be in trouble in some parts of the world, and uh, I think that's deeply to be regretted. Um, but there is enough enlightenment, I, I, I think, and I hope, for us to be able to see the light and to move forward into a, a new era. And uh, I certainly hope that the USA comes to its senses and joins the world again. But, uh, you know, under George W. Bush, they went in the wrong direction. Under Barack Obama, they moved back into the right direction, certainly on these issues. And we don't know how things are looking, but uh, certainly uh, through the appointments of the Trump administration into the EPA and other really critical appointments, it, it, it's not looking as though this is, a, this is an era of environmental enlightenment. Um, and I just hope that we can maintain the momentum in the international space and tell it like it is and speak truth to power. But uh, you know, I, want, uh, I want us to, to celebrate what we've achieved, to celebrate the science behind it, and, uh, and to acknowledge that in spite of polarization, we can make, we can make progress. And uh, I would really like to see that this message is, is um, communicated more widely in South Africa and more appreciated. Uh, so it's not seen as an elite thing. I, I think that's a great, uh, that's a great pity. Nonetheless, that, that's all I want to say. And <clears throat> thanks very much for listening. And uh, I've been so glad to be a part of this story. And I hope to remain a part of it for, for some time. Yeah, uh, I realize that a guy has to run off to some meetings. I, I want to make a quick comment before he dashes off. I'm uh, still uh, excellent uh, talk. It makes very good points that we organized ourselves, the scientific community, and IPCC. It's done a wonderful job. But uh, there's a few quick statements. A, uh, I don't believe that the U.S. has a monopoly on stupidity. Uh, it, it's far more widespread, and I would argue that uh, China, for example, contributing uh, to reducing uh, burning of coal and so forth, has much more to do with frightful pollution in cities such as Beijing and Shanghai than it has to do with the global climate. Uh, China's in serious trouble right at home, and they're simply acting in response to local grievances. So we didn't, shouldn't be so optimistic as if the rest of the world has seen the light and is acting in the interest of the globe as a whole. The, the, the second point I want to make is 
that I emphasize the science is organized skepticism. And because of that, science is not democratic. That uh, I find daily in the newspaper, I read the New York Times, everybody quotes that the vast majority of scientists say this or that. Uh, in science, it's entirely possible for the vast majority to be completely wrong and for one person to be right. Science is not democratic. We do not have referenda or elections to be deciding whether we continue to observe Newton's laws, whether they should now be abandoned. Uh, we constantly test. As regards the science of global warming, we're in poor shape. Uh, I went to a meeting a few months ago, an international meeting, where all the climate modelers got together. And climate modeling is in very bad shape. Uh, the confidence you should have in predictions of what's going to happen over the next several decades is slight. Uh, intriguingly, uh, the problem can be used to one word, it, it's clouds, we don't know how to deal with them. But my main point is we need more scientists and we need scientists who challenge the accepted view. So we're in a very tricky position. The public politicians want to uh, be assured they, they live in a world where people vote. They want to be assured that the vast majority believe something. Uh, if you want to, have, I'm reading a book at the moment called uh, The Gene. It's actually a wonderful summary of what uh, the advances in biology over the last hundred years. And the main point there is simply that there was complete consensus a hundred years ago about the benefits of eugenics. Uh, all sorts of prestigious institutions, everybody thought this was a good thing. It was nothing but racism. Uh, it was only when the Nazis took it too far. So it's very, very dangerous to rely on consensus opinions. Uh, we need dissent in science. We need to be critical. And so in general, to regard consensus as a major scientific achievement, I have serious trouble with that. Uh, well, can I come back on that? Sure. Uh, it, by, by consensus, uh, we're referring to political consensus. That no, actually- no, I'm referring to IPCC consensus. It's not in science interest to have referenda. Well, uh, in order to get political, uh, 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 to move forward on taking action, uh, the consensus that is reached is reached between uh, people with science evidence and people with the political uh, demands placed upon them. So it's, it's really, uh, it's quite a strong ethically defensible consensus. So how much, how confident are we? And how confident are we uh, in the light of the science and in the light of the political demands that certain actions need to be taken? And that's the consensus. So the science, we never have full confidence in, in any scientific finding. We know that. The question is, how much confidence do you need to make a decision that could save the world? It's the same story with, with, with ozone and the Montreal Protocol. We saved the world just in time. Uh, there was no consensus in the beginning when, when CFCs were discovered to, to be destroying ozone. But that consensus built over the course of a decade. And we now know that we dodged a bullet. So how much, uh, how much is, is needed is the question. It's, it's a question of taking decisions in the face of uncertainty. Science contributes to that, but political demands also contribute to it. And you know, there's enough consensus. The models may be poor, but we don't only rely on the models. We rely on historical understanding. We rely on fundamental physics. We rely on a whole range of evidence, um, historical changes, etc., uh, deep history and recent history. So it, it's, it's it, to, to say that one person could be wrong, uh, uh, everybody could be wrong, and one person person could be right. It's because there's very little wiggle space anymore for the global warming debate to be able to say that it's still possible. So and and the politicians, you know, have been convinced by that evidence. And it's that that's the consensus I think we need. I'm not saying that we should not be skeptical anymore, but how how how, how skeptical do we need to be? If it slows activity in the face of clear and present danger, clearly that's not a rational route. So anyway, yeah. we could debate this back and forth. Uh, yeah. at the, we could debate it back and forth for 25 years. 
in one of the hottest in one of the hottest debates science policy debate for in the world we've learned an enormous amount from it and we can't discount that so what i'm saying is that that is a very it's a, a valuable lesson to humanity and um okay thank you so much uh prof i'm sure it's a it's a very controversial issue and i mean i'd like to like to have a Look, seminar on that um no, let me just, well. just one quick sentence, please. Uh, I don't actually disagree with much of what Guy has to say. Uh, all yes. I'm pleading for is that we need to continue having tests and that a uh, very obvious test is the seasonal cycle. So I'm hoping to get Guy's support is that we can have stringent tests for our models by looking at the signal that uh, occurs reliably. I'm fully in support. Fully. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to have to stop you there because uh, we have to continue. If we don't start now, we'll never make, uh, make it uh, in time. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Guy. Lovely to see you, George, and congratulations and, on your uh, <laughs> Thanks. Fantastic. So, um, can I continue? Thank you. Um, so, we have Prof. Albert uh, Modi um, talk on uh, his perspective or his research perspective as well on African perspective and uh, global uh, climate change challenges. But unfortunately, uh, Prof. Albert is, uh, won't make it due to his unwell. So we wish him a speedy recovery and uh, apologize for his absence. We have uh, uh, Rob O'Donoghue, Professor Emeritus at the Environmental Research Center from Rose University. And I think we're quite privileged to have him at uh, the University of Kosovo. And uh, so Prof, uh, you know, he looks at environment processes of learning-led uh, change. And uh, he has contributed to the Habitable Planet Workshop or program and has been excited on how it has stimulated the learner-led social movement. And uh, I'll let Prof do most of the talking, but through his studies, um, lecture here today, he will convey such some of the sense of how South Africa, or Southern Africa is a special place and how our people and landscapes hold an exciting social, ecological capital for learning, very important in our whole nexus in our environmental systems. Uh, uh, and uh, without uh, further delay, over you to Prof. Uh, Rob uh, for his lecture. Thank you, Prof. Thank you very much indeed. This is a, a new and strange format to me, but um, one thing I can share with you at the outset is that things are highly organized here at um, UKZN, and um, I think we're better off than most of you. Popcorn here. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but onto the serious business of the day. Um, what I'd like to do is to look at um, how, how white paper called for climate um, education. And this has proliferated all over the world. And it's mostly come from the scientists. Um, many of the students are quite critical in South Africa, kind of science, sort of colonizing science. Everything comes from one direction. And one of the interesting things in the habitable planet is, is that it's been more conversation, more a dialogue, a download, if you like. Look at the download approach to science. Scientists have come with the necessary concepts, the knowledge and grasp of climate change, as Guy has so eloquently described. And they've mapped out an agreed understanding of the facts, again, like Guy illustrated. With this, we've had the inclusion of um, education initiatives 
on climate science. It's primarily been communicating the climate science, trying to get the message across, again, as, as Guy said. Predominantly think of creating awareness, looking at social learning initiatives, and mitigating risk or adaptation to the change. The challenge that I'd like to raise is people always seem to be becoming aware of more sustainable futures is seldom evident. And what I want to try to do is to raise gaps that I think that the Habitable Planet workshops are successfully starting to engage um, could be very important to go towards a stronger seasonal source and more engaged type of a pro outlining. Because there's certain absences here, conventional way that climate science is being presented the expert download perspective. So I hope to open up a more community engaged and a more situated seasonal cycles approach that we're starting to develop in South Africa. And in agreement with George, I'd like to say that we have got something special here. We have got something that is worth investing in. And what I'd like to do is to challenge all of the young scientists, the young climate scientists, to actually broaden the scope of your work. The um, habitable planet is seemingly doing. And the harvest program, I think climate, climate science, to be able to think the situation that we feel over the world, and particularly in the poverty in Africa. What I'd like to do is, is to take, take us back timing in African agrarian cultures. And we have got a very special capital here in South Africa as a whole, where as people, we always remain dependent upon the sun, the wind, and the rain, natural forces over which we can assert little or no control. But we try to adjust ourselves to the seasonal cycles to the best of their knowledge. And that is what in many areas in South Africa. So I'm going to take a journey through cutting up in the West Africa, in Ghana, amongst the Korobo, then down to the Bemba in Zambia, and then the equator. Probably one of the most stable systems that might and is influenced by other climatic forces. I actually even learned about this in school as the area of the ITCZ, you know, so you go um, in terms of the intertropical convergence. So move south to the Shona in Zimbabwe, and then to the Zulu on the grasslands of Zululand, in the um, eastern part of Grahamstown, um, Rhodes University is, you start getting into much more um, variable climatic um, situations. And you start finding that the social ecological two are rich and exciting. Start this little journey, and all I can do, and in the knowledge that I have, is to check in students to take up this and to explore it. And I'll just touch upon it and hope that it is of interest to you. So let's look at early. African social ecological alignment with the seasonal cycles and look at some evidence starting with the um, Korobo in Ghana where tracking the movement of the sun until it shone through a crack in the rocky hillside was a long established, a long durée um, process in this part of the world and just would read the cyclical process alongside the associated building of the rain-bearing clouds, enabling them to align the seasonal planting with the arrival of the rainy season. Long established system, of course, in a very, very cl um, stable climatic area. Now, on the other side of the equator, one finds the Bemba in Zambia. Similar habitat, more forested, 
and you find that there's the chitamene, slash and burn agriculture, um, in the leached forest soils, vilified in the colonial process as an inappropriate and destructive form of agriculture. This also included, in terms of the recent work that's been done, a long fallow cycle for ecosystem recovery. And of course, also included the fire control of the soil nematodes. And of course, with the armyworm at the moment, these kinds of small scale um, uh, control systems developed could be very, very interesting to explore. Um, Fundikilia is a biochar process that developed with the changes that occurred on Moyombo woodland, where people with the culture of the Chitimene started to produce much more biochar processes using bushes and um, also grasses. Effect of enabling to persist within the seasonal variations that occurred. In Zambia now, the rains are coming in December, where they normally arrived in November. People um, within this change are able to adapt to it. And today one's got hybrid biochar systems, still including intercropping, which has been long established in these um, forested areas. Mombo continues into northern part of Zimbabwe, and there you find the Mashona people, and they had a fire-shaped woodland pasture system as opposed to an agricultural system. And that was really interesting because the summer pastures were supported by the dapple shade and the nitrogen-fixing woodland trees, and the more rank pastures were in the open, providing thatching grass for the homes and supporting herds all year round. But during the summer season, with the rain and with the nitrogen, the nutrient grasses were in the shady area where the cattle could persist even in um, very, very high temperate areas um, in these areas. Now, as we move further south and east to the Zulu, and here I am in KwaZulu-Natal, where we have the wonderful grasslands that were created in um, burning cycles, we find a similar pattern of seasonal burning, expanding the grasslands of Zululand over many generations. And these grasslands supported very, very large populations, herding culture. Generational knowledge they also patterning that manage pasture and the needs. In seasonal cycles that were much more variable, cyclone in the Indian Ocean, and it came in and brought heavy rains, and last year we had droughts. So you start getting to high variability. It's the high variability really interesting from a point of view of teaching and learning about climate change. And a little bit more time going further south into the areas of the Tosa with the climate migration. Their alignment within a very, very variable um, climatic system and variability is becoming a um, more common pattern um, in the southern African area. Belt, um, which is between the ocean, the Bushmans, and the Fish River, area that the Tosa used to go to, but to winter grazing or early summer grazing in the surf in, in the um, sweet felt of the Amatola Mountains. If it was a good season, they would stay there all year. If it was a dry start to the season, felt grasses would be diminished. All of their herds, Sazur felt, where a little rain produces very, very rich grasses for a short period of time and gives a rest to the Amatola Mountain sweet felt system. Pastures remain nutritious throughout the year but could not support the continuous heavy grazing in dry years and to the zero felt in summer. It is referred to by the researchers as a transhumanist pattern, 
but it was cut and dislocated by the colonial boundaries, including the Zurfeld and Torza as seasonal occupants during the colonial period. So this entire system was disrupted. If one looks at a social ecological landscape of change, a little challenge that you can find seasonal cycles even in a cupboard. A cupboard that I came across wanted me to buy some furniture um, by the Retief family in the Grahamstown store, and it tells the story about started to actually do this Zurfeld migration and it was made from two wagon boxes. I renovated it and then I gave it back family home where my colleague house now and it's now sitting there as an amazing memento of seasonal cycles. The wagon boxes in the and go up to Bushman's Neck with their cattle. Then they would come felt. And you got a similar migration. You got the forced sedentary farming in your period. And then you started to get the globalization of trade through great general dealers. So look around you, see seasonal cycles, socio-cultural patterns in so much that is around us. If we take the Eastern Cape landscape in 1928 at the and into the present, um, and this was produced by Cox, that in the left hand communities were much more diverse spread over the landscape. And then they got the villagization right, separation process, and you get the pattern that you have today. In this area, not only did they have the migration, but particularly amongst the Mpondo, um, who moved down from the area um, around northern Zululand, they brought with them um, a pattern of agriculture that involved Gilesha, and that was adopted by the Zulu as the Mpondo became Zulu. And you had the wrong constellations occurring in the early winter, and Gilesha involved the breaking of the sod of the previous crop. The um, seed beds were then prepared, and this was done in, in about July, um, because during this time, if there was an early onset drought, the sweet felt grasses wouldn't be able to support the cattle, the cattle would get thin, and they wouldn't have the strength to be able to plow. Hungry, and this practice of galeshing of the soil surface and it made it receptive to any rain, so it would infiltrate in that area. And now, in that area, amongst the agriculturalists, they're talking about rainfall event agriculture. Event can occur in different times. So you can see that the seasonal cycle adaptations offer us great excitement in terms of being able to undertake um, research. To pull this together, what does this mean to our climate science? How has the Habitable Planet Workshop been so important? Homi Baba notes that um, narratives of um, cultural domination yield a third space. So we don't have to have the downloading of science, communication about climate change theory, creative forms of cultural identity that are produced at the boundaries in between forms of difference and at the intersections and overlaps and what i want to show some of these intersections and overlaps that the habitable planet has been exploring recognize how knowledge structures in culture um, operate the shared space between everyday knowledge indigenous knowledge and science and it's in these shared spaces that you start getting the subjugated knowledges, the knowledges of, of Africa that have been pushed aside, coming back into the story from two hours. So what does such a thing look like? You get the 
the situated acquisition of knowledge, and this comes into complex constellations where we live. Constellations can be informed by what used to be practices. But they can also be for, informed by modern culture, and that George was referring to, and that guy was exemplifying. So when you look at this pattern, you can start seeing that it's really important if we're going to be working with the seasonal cycles type of approach, that we take into account the science and the everyday, looking across and bringing out social learning. So you start getting the bringing out of heritage being important in landscape. You start getting out the bringing in of climate science to actually deepen that understanding together of the contextual concerns of the future and future sustainability that guy was talking about about better articulation within the uh, in seasonal cycles is a very serious area for research for um, climate science pull it together um, to, to leave you with a seasonal cycle approach to climate education is about deliberative learning for situated transitioning. We're in a situation of transitioning in a changing world. And for this, we actually need to engage in situated reasoning, seasonal activities that we're involved in, whether it's going to the beach, okay? Whether it is in agriculture or whether it is just in daily life. And we need to bring in the climate science reasoning for the seasonal cycles, as George and, and Guy exemplified. But the recent practice situated social ecological cycles. These all need to fit together in our climate science. Thank you very much. That was excellent. <laughs> oh, lovely talk. Brilliant talk. Thank you very much, Prof, uh, for making time and putting us in your, in your schedule. I know you're busy <laughs> from what I've spoken to you about earlier. And uh, yeah, um, I don't want to take that any more for, any uh, way further. Uh, but it's just nice to view, like, uh, things that you do at home to the larger picture, uh, picture of the Earth system. I'd like to go now, um, I know we're coming close to our termination time. So for a few questions, I know you have like hundreds of questions on YouTube as an... Um, Carl? Are you there? Uh, yes, hang on, hang on, sorry, let me just put the video back. Okay, uh, I've got a few questions. I'm going to have to be a little bit selective because there was a, a lot going on on YouTube. Uh, I'll read some of the ones out from online first, and then I'll go over to the room in Cape Town, uh, and then I'll come to see if we have questions in uh, KZN. Uh, so I'll go from the ones online first. Uh, most of for George. Uh, I guess maybe we'll catch up a little bit while George is answering to see if there are some for Rob. Uh, the first one comes from Basantin and Lazi, uh, who asks, oh, I can't read my own writing. <laughs> he says, if, if you have this separation between science and ethical questions, what do you, George, perceive as scientists' role in ethical issues? Do we have a role, and if so, what? Um, yeah, the, so scientists live in two very different worlds, and it's very it makes life very difficult. Uh, the, the world of science is quite simple; it, it's objective. There is an answer to problems. Uh, it has no role for compromise. If you say that two plus two is six, and I say it's eight, we don't settle as seven is the right answer. Uh, there usually is an answer in science. Uh, and it's entirely independent of race, gender, age, ethnicity. Uh, 
completely different from the world of human affairs. In the world of human affairs, uh, compromise is essential and compassion is of critical importance. And so how do we bridge these two worlds? And our, our beliefs are extremely strong. I mean, uh, just think of people thousands of years had debates about whether the earth is round or flat. And then they had a debate about whether the earth is at the center of the universe or whether it isn't. This literally led to wars, people getting killed about these beliefs. In retrospect, completely silly. What difference does it make to your life whether the earth is round or flat? Uh, it matters if you're flying an aeroplane around. Or similarly, my main point is that we need to acknowledge that scientists have very difficult roles. Uh, they need to be critical, skeptical, uh, objective. And when they live in the world of science, when they live in the world of human affairs, they have completely different criteria. We shouldn't pretend that this is easy or that we've succeeded. Uh, there's no simple answer to, to that question, uh, except I insist that we need to acknowledge it. Uh, the IPCC is a wonderful thing, uh, but it was created to bridge the divide between scientists and policymakers, the extremely difficult problem. Uh, I feel that there ought to be a group, and it's absent at the moment, that simply remains critical of global warming for scientific reasons. Uh, we need to go ahead and act. We need to reduce CO2, but it should not stop some of us from questioning the scientific results. OK. Thank you, George. Sorry, just bear with me. Sorry, uh, thank you. Can I just tell one story that impressed me very much? Okay. There was a philosopher, uh, Isaiah Berlin, who said, uh, let's go back 100 years, the year 1900. He said, if you ask uh, historians at that point to anticipate the two major developments the next 100 years, they would have gotten one right and one wrong. What they would have gotten right is anticipating enormous scientific advances. They may not have anticipated cell phones or laptops, but they would have anticipated by the year 1900, there was electricity, people were starting to fly. Historians would have anticipated scientific research is going to progress enormously. The second thing that they would have gotten completely wrong uh, is events that cost the lives of tens of millions of people. And it was the rise of ideologies, uh, the communists, the fascists, the apartheid regime, all sorts of terrible. And he claims uh, so the rise of ideologies was not anticipated in the year 1900. And Berlin says there's a link between these two things, that people fall too much in love with science. As I said, scientists aren't compromising. There's one answer for everything. Then they start to think scientific approaches can be applied to social problems. It happened in South Africa where a group of people thought that they had the solution to social problems, that it was a past date. Uh, it happened in Italy, it happened in Russia, all sorts of places. It's a serious mistake to think that science can solve every problem. And so when we deal with global warming, which involves both science and human affairs, it becomes very, very difficult. That's the reason why it is so polarizing at the moment. And we need to acknowledge this big divide between how we approach scientific problems and how we approach social problems. Well, I'll stop there. Thanks, George. And I'm going to have to ask you, we have quite a few questions I'd like to get through, so to try and keep it brief. But I know you'll enjoy this one. Uh, uh, Sue from Scion uh, asks, uh, do you think that the, therefore that the currency that we assess science by should be moved from number of publications to number of solutions offered? <laughs> Uh, people respond to how they get rewarded. Uh, when I started my career, you were considered very productive if you published one or two papers a year. And usually you try to be thoughtful and have some significant result. Nowadays, my colleagues publish readily a dozen papers a year. And this is simply because the university, the deans, and people who hand out the rewards, uh, believe that they can quantify the number of papers you publish is a measure of how productive how bright you are or how do you work. It, it's a serious mistake. Uh, I have no simple answer, but all I can say is 
the emphasizing simply we shouldn't confuse activity with accomplishment. You, you can write lots and lots of papers, go to dozens and dozens of meetings and actually not accomplish anything. Again, it, it's not a question I really have an answer to, except that uh, I, I blame, ultimately, there was a place in Shanghai that started to rank the world's universities. And people are obsessed with tables, who's number one, who's number two. So they rank universities. And I was absolutely amazed that South Africa even pays attention to this ranking. But they're very concerned about where they are on this scale. It, it's immaterial, the uh, ranking. I know people are obsessed with it, but trying not to pay attention to it. OK, thank you, George. Uh, Dr. Zabanda from the University of Zuliland says, thanks for uh, the exciting insights. What's your take on how you think South Africa should respond to dealing with the problems of climate change? Yeah, uh, that, uh, uh, I wrote these two pages. I proposed that you send those to the people who ask questions. Uh, it's basically, I see a need for somebody to step forward and to take, uh, to propose a problem that is not polarizing the seasonal cycle and to organize something that I would consider bottom up. There are two modes of doing science. The one is top down. Some international committee decides on the agenda and everybody follows that. And the IPCC is an excellent example of that. And when you have very ambitious goals, putting a man on the moon or developing huge climate models, that's the approach. Uh, there is a complementary approach that is bottom up. Start with small groups of scientists sitting together, identifying a problem, working. That used to be far more common in the 1970s, 80s. Since the end of the Cold War, it's fallen aside. Uh, Basically, we do science for two reasons. One, we have one practical benefits, and the other one is simply out of curiosity. We want to know why the sky is blue. Right? Knowing why the sky is blue may not have any practical benefits whatsoever, but it will bring you pleasure. Uh, you will have your curiosity satisfied. At the moment, the emphasis with the end of communism emphasizes heavily on science for practical benefits. And I see an urgent need for a country, especially South Africa, to step forward and to encourage people, some small fraction of the scientific community, to simply pursue science for the sake of curiosity. That's my goal, and I feel that the study of the seasonal cycle can accomplish that. That uh, it's, it's an entirely, in some sense, obvious signal. It happens regularly, whether we like it or not. And it has many scientific features that are unexplained and surprising. And it will contribute to it's a climate models. It will bring very practical benefits, even though it may not seem like that. In, in general, uh, Carl can give you a copy of a book called Little Science into Small Science that talks about the need for these two complementary goals of science, science for practical benefits and science of curiosity. Uh, we all understand our practical benefits. I see a need to push the other side. And I'd like to say, George, did you see the other side as being more important in attracting students to science, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the, the scientists are queer people. Right? We, we don't do what we do for money or glory or whatever. We simply do it because we are not curious. And such people can make valuable contributions. OK. I have one question uh, for Rob uh, in KZN. Uh, Rob Neville uh, from Access uh, wants to know uh, if you could explain a bit more what you mean by everyday items and why. Do you guys follow that in case then? I get the question. We've lost you. Um, uh, no, can is, you please repeat the question? Sure. Question is uh, what does Rob define as? As, as everyday objects and why. In his talk, he talked about uh, using the seasonal cycle and everyday objects. Never want clarity on that, please. Okay. The, the, the everyday objects the life experience of people here. 
experiences that they make decisions around. The everyday object that I was referring to, which had a particular story, and the idea was that if we can kind of like look into the way we work with everyday things, how these articulate with the season, the dynamics of changing seasons, then we're having interesting conversations that are coming out of our life experience. We're able to relate to our policies work and things to be. So every day bring into the conversation. So they're not just there to listen and learn, they're there to contribute and to build knowledge um, about their own um, everyday situation. Okay, thank you, Rob. Uh, lastly, uh, well, not ultimately, I'm throwing it over to the room. The microphone is on. Uh, uh, okay, we'll go here then. Um, George, I believe it was George mentioned um, basically making the United States irrelevant to the conversation about uh, carbon and global climate change. But I would ask, how could you do that with the second largest? emitter of carbon dioxide in the world. That's part one of my question. And the second part of my question is kind of, how is that going to work? Every person that I talk to on the street here tells me, why did I move to South Africa? They want to move to the United States so they can live that carbon dioxide heavy, drive a big car, have extra fridges and lots of food and throw right? They want that carbon dioxide emitting lifestyle. And they see nothing wrong with it. So how how can that be irrelevant when everyone aspires to it and and the United States is still sitting there emitting all this carbon dioxide? No, the, the second question is easier. It's not really those people don't express a desire to burn carbon dioxide. They express a desire to use energy, and there are other sources of energy. And, and Guy had a very valuable point. We've actually reduced CO two emissions by switching to solar and the wind and so forth. So these people can have their cake and eat it. They can use all these energy consuming gadgets, protocols and aerobase and so on. But uh, we have to switch to alternative sources of energy. And we're advancing very rapidly on that. Uh, I didn't quite get your first question. So um, the United, there was a characterization that the United States was going to become irrelevant the global conversation on reducing emissions and dealing with climate change. And as the second largest emitter of carbon dioxide in the world, how how can you make the United States irrelevant? Is unfortunately kind of the elephant in the room. The United States can easily double its carbon emissions, you know, with poor policies and uh, maybe doing away with the EPA and things like that, right? So it's, it's now the behemoth. It's, really set to unravel a lot of global progress, in my view. Yeah, if I understood the question, uh, I'm not sure. I, uh, Carl, could you repeat the question? I'm not sure I read it properly. You want to try, Carl? Yeah, I'll try. So the, uh, the question is, how uh, can we write off or ignore the US uh, in the global warming conversation when actually they're one of the biggest emitters and if Trump goes around uh, removing the EPA, et cetera, then emissions could double. Oh, I see. Uh, yeah, no, the US is a huge country. I guess it's almost 300 million people. Uh, Trump represents a fairly small group. Uh, the, they're very vocal and they're politically active. Uh, so don't underestimate the US environmental group. It's extremely strong. Uh, I wouldn't get pessimistic immediately. Uh, the, the, the Trump's effect on other social issues, I think, is going to be much worse than it is on the environment. So they'll set back a few things. But there's a really, uh, the US also has states, and many states set their own policies. Uh, you know, California by itself would be one of the world's richest countries. And it has a very strong environmental policies and it tends to go its own way. It tends to go. Anyways, I wouldn't be too concerned on that score. Uh, the environmental movement here is a very strong one. Uh, 
Uh, I have one suggestion. I mean, I, I thought this old confidence, I particularly like Rob's talk, but I, I thought a guy made very valuable points. We have different opinions. But I want to recommend this uh, rather than one hour. Maybe somebody should organize a one or two day conference on the same topic in the seasonal cycle. And a good occasion in August in Cape Town, there's going to be a huge international meeting. And it's not the appropriate place for this, but maybe if we add on a day or two before or afterwards, a uh, South African organized meeting devoted to the seasonal cycle and invite some of these foreigners to participate. I think it could be very successful. As a prelude to that, there could be a few more talks such as this. Uh, 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 but uh, if something will happen in August, it has to be organized fairly soon. Sure. One more here. Um, speak up loud. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, uh, George and uh, uh, Roy. It was a very interesting talk. Uh, so I just have uh, two questions, or like one for, for you, George, and one for, for Roy. Uh, now, the, 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 the idea, the, I think the narrative, the example that you use about rugby and the whole business of uh, sort of uh, uh, communicating it, that uh, everybody become part of the story uh, in the 1996 World Cup, um, so you use this narrative as it relates to science, and, and, and my question is, uh, you know, there, there is another question of who's doing this science, and uh, and, and how's being done, which is an important question. So I mean, how 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 are you thinking about what, what's the bottleneck really of liberating perhaps how we of this whole idea of liberating how we think about science or how we should do science, you know? I mean, in the implementation of the seasonal cycle and and, and all of that, because I think. From what I'm, from what I'm sitting, it seems like there, there is perhaps a need, or there is a room for an improvement, or a adjustment of perspective on how we look at science. So I mean, so the question is, where do you think is the bottom to what uh, this idea, and what are the things that you suggest that perhaps we should be looking at in sort of doing better science? Now, in the in the same way, so I mean, so Rob, you you. George first. Uh, okay, I, I mean, I've heard today, so... Okay, let me answer that quickly. Uh, there's a topic called the science of science. Uh, you, you take all the scientific papers that are published, you look at all the people who reference them, and what are the topics, and so forth, and you say, so regard that as data, and you ask, what can I say about this topic? And there's a fascinating book that I recommend, it can be downloaded from the web, called Little Science into Small Science. But the... Uh, the summary of the whole story what is science, it's amazingly much like sports. Uh, if South Africa wants a good soccer team at the next World Cup, uh, all it needs are 11 good players. To produce 11 good players, it turns out every child in South Africa should start getting involved in soccer, should kick a ball. And you need such a background to produce some, a few exceptional players. The science turns out to be a very undemocratic business. A few people get most of the attention, they do most of the work. This has been quantified in terms of statistics, which papers get referenced the most, uh, who does most of the work. Uh, it's in some sense a sad story in that most papers that get published never get referenced, or maybe once. A few papers get a lot of attention, but it's no different in sports. The most prominent, everybody know who Messi is you know, interested in soccer, he is the big star of Ronaldo. Uh, I'm sure there are all sorts of other soccer players all over the place. But science is very much like that, it's hierarchical. So we need a strong, strong base of support. We need to get all children in South Africa have to get a good science education. Everybody has to take an interest from that will be a superb support science activity. Okay, thanks. We have a question for Rob. There's a bit of a connection issue with KZN, but let's see how we go. Yeah, okay. So, so my question is, uh, um, I think you, you said a, a very an interesting narrative by, by providing sort of an African narrative of how the seasonal cycle and how science works. But I think from schools and textbooks and so on, the examples that we get uh, and so on, you know, it, it, pro it provides a perspective that is rather not local. I think it becomes... Um, um, a bit challenging to connect um, what we grew up seeing or what we understand about the, uh, the African narrative and science. And I think you, you made a bridge which is very interesting. 
And I, I think, do, do you do you think that in, in going forward, is there a room perhaps we should, um, is there a need perhaps to um, think about how we teach science or how we think about the narrative of science in an African perspective? Or, or in your perspective, how do you think that um, the story that you're presenting become um, relevant, you know, in the education of science or uh, going forward, you know, particularly looking at uh, perhaps higher education in science and, and at school, you know, like how, how, how do we connect the two? Because I think that brings closer to the question of who is doing science? Do we, I mean, is it a local endeavor, you know, if, if that makes sense? question of the African Republic, how much of the science appears as nonsense children and um, to understand this we started to explore how it is life experiences have been excluded um, because of the education and uh, we need to look into these um, so Carl can share with you a copy of the paper that, that we've produced to challenge the textbooks. When I was doing for to find of cultural orientation, ecological systems, seasonal cycles across the variable climatic regions in Africa, Possible to find that information. I managed to get it really by word of mouth um, with African scholars in the various parts of. And I think, think that's one of the strengths that you, as an African scholar, can actually bring not only with the latest books and the latest thinking, but with research who are actually exploring the African and African and then become writers who are writing the stuff up so that it can actually be um, disseminated and stimulate the kind of thinking that you're wanting to have and that is making the connection between the, the and what science able to What we do and how we do things. Thank you all for systems and for debate and discussion. System that went five minutes over our time limit, and I'd like to terminate now. But before I do, I'd like to thank all our guests and speakers. Uh, thank you for making the time. Thank you for the students, those that are on YouTube, those that are come to the venues. Um, every Thursday, uh, the last Thursday of every month, we'll be having these HPW online uh, seminars. Please contribute and don't let the conversation in there. We have uh, our HPW Facebook page um, as well as a Twitter account where you can keep the conversation going. And if you have any questions, uh, engage with us and uh, I'm sure Carl and, and all of us would be waiting to hear from you. So if there's any I don't think we have time for any more questions I'd like to turn to you next Thursday or the last Thursday and just watch your email uh, for the next series that are coming um, on our online uh, seminars. Thank you very much all and uh, have a good, good day.